Hello everyone, welcome to the Serverless Framework Online Meetup. Uh, this is essentially a webinar. Uh, I already delivered this exact same webinar in Hebrew, but we got some requests to deliver this webinar in English, so we're doing it in English. So pardon my French, okay, since I'm not an English speaker, I'm not sure my accent will be suitable to your ears, but I hope you will endure it. All right, so even though it says getting started with serverless framework, it's mainly aimed to use with the uh, AWS uh, cloud provider. Like, okay, so let's move on. Um, just a few things even before we start. First of all, there is a delay between uh, me talking and the chat. Okay, so you might ask a question in the chat and I will answer it approximately after five to 10 seconds. Okay, so bear that in, your, in mind. Uh, the presentation is available at, and now I will send you the link in the chat. And also, if you want to read some uh, theory about uh, serverless framework, you can just get it in the serverless uh, template that we're going to use. We are going to use um, this GitHub repository, and the link that I've just sent in the chat you, it will redirect you to, I will just scroll down, it, it will redirect you to theory and then you can expand. And just in case you are not sure which service or, or like what's Lambda function, what's, an Ada, what's a Lambda layer, API gateway and stuff like that, uh, just in case I talk too fast or something, then you can simply go here and read about it. I just took some quotes from the original documents and also some use cases, uh, how the API works, you know. So if, in case you just want to browse some more information, you can read it over there. So basically, we're going to just use this GitHub repository. Again, I sent it in the chat. And since it's a YouTube stream, then it's recorded. So in case you can't watch it right now or you want to recommend it to one of your friends, you can just uh, I don't know, send, send them the link to this same... Uh, YouTube stream and eventually it will be a recording. And I also said in the description that I'm going to, to, to talk about uh, Lambda layers. And since Lambda layers is a bit of a complicated subject, so we'll touch it, but we won't dive in too deep into details. I mean, I will show you how it works, but we're not going to create a layer from scratch. Okay, that's uh, the point and feel free to ask questions in the chat. Now, since nobody said anything in the chat, just to see that we have some viewers over here because I can see that we have some viewers, can you just type some something like hi or something like that so I can see that we have people over here? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Meir Gabay. Hold on, close leg. My name is Meir Gabay. I work at Podops.io. You can uh, reach out to me in my uh, work email or in LinkedIn with direct message and see my GitHub repositories over here. Read my blog post as medium over here. I'm a DevOps, con DevOps consultant and I mainly work with uh, serverless framework and uh, serverless architecture and also Kubernetes, though it's not related to this uh, meetup. Maybe if you wanna chat about Kubernetes, we can also do that. And just so you see who am I, you know, we have this uh, cool face over here, but let's just see who am I. So this is me, okay, it's not a recording. It's a live video, I'm here, uh, I'm not gonna use this uh, video that you see over here because it's going to annoy you because I speak a lot with, with my hands. So I'm going to shut it off and we're going to view the presentation. So how it's gonna go, okay? I will use the presentation at first just to show you some very, very basic concepts. And the main concept, the main thing I wanna show you in this meetup is how to work with the serverless YAML file. I know we didn't even, talk about what a serverless YAML file, but the main purpose is how to write a proper serverless YAML file and how to structure your project like this one. So you'll be able to start working with a serverless framework. Okay, so let's start. Uh, ah, sorry, just a few words about ProDops, forgot about that. So ProDops is based uh, in Israel, Tel Aviv. Uh, we also have people uh, in London and in Miami. 
uh, Forbes was established uh, in in uh, 2013. Already did more than 100 projects. Uh, you might know us previously as DevOps or DevOps Pro. Some of our clients, uh, just so you see with who we work and stuff like that. And good. Now let's see the topics of this meetup. So first, we're going to learn how to manage all your applications code Lambda functions in one place. How to easily build and deploy your, your Lambda functions to AWS. And sorry that for those who are using Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure, this is aiming for AWS. If you use Google Cloud Platform, this also can help you, but it will be a bit off. Okay, so you'll have to do the adjustments yourselves. Manage your infrastructure like API Gateway, S3 Bucket as code. I wrote here ETC, you know, the etc. because we can also manage any infrastructure such as CloudFront distribution and EC2 and anything that you can create with CloudFormation, and we'll talk about that, you can create with the serverless framework. Get familiar with all the objects in the serverless framework, which are functions, events, resources, services, and plugins. And functions also includes Lambda layers. And learn best practices on how to use this uh, framework and to get you started quickly and efficiently. And we're going to do a live demo of how to deploy a simple to-do API. And it's not really gonna be a live demo. We are going to go through the logs of, uh, I, I did some uh, CI CD process, which can show you step by step of how all of the to do API application was deployed, including the grid API was deployed. Okay, so we're just gonna read through the logs and understand which commands did I uh, execute to make the applications work. Moving on. So serverless framework, let's talk about that. Serverless framework supports multiple cloud providers. Again, we're gonna talk about AWS. And uh, it automatically, automatically generates a cloud formation template and creates a cloud formation stack. So for those of you who are not sure what's cloud formation and what it is, if you know Terraform, then cloud formation should be very easy for you. Cloud formation is the AWS platform to create all of your infrastructure as code, maintain all of your infrastructure as code. So instead of going to the UI, for example, and just create a Lambda function over here, I can just write down a few lines of code in the serverless framework, and it will create a Lambda function for me with all of the relevant events and stuff like that. So this also applies to any service in AWS, all right? Anything that is supported with CloudFormation, which is, this is CloudFormation, okay? Um, we can create with a serverless framework. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how are you how you're familiar with the cloud formation, so I will try to to also explain about that. Okay, so you can go to in your AWS account, go to services, search for cloud formation, and if you haven't used it yet, probably you won't have any stacks over here. But eventually, once we deploy the application, we will have a few stacks like I have over here, and each stack has you can see the events for creating the stacks. You can see the resources that this stack includes. This means all of these are AWS resources that were created just by supplying a template. You know, this is the code that is automatically generated by serverless framework. And if you want to see it like, uh, you know, as a normal code, I can just show you a cool trick in CloudFormation. Serverless framework generates a CloudFormation YAML file, all right, a template. And in case you want to see it beautifully, what you can do after it's deployed, I, and you have it recorded, so in case you're like, it's not relevant for now, you can get it back to it later. So view in designer, and then <clears throat> go to relevant stack, view in designer, and then a cool trick would be, I'm just zooming out, moving one of the objects. Wait, and look, look, see here, this was scrambled, it was a gibberish, but now I can see a normal uh, template. Also, this is in JSON. So in case you want to see it in YAML, you can just hit on YAML. And this is what the serverless framework generates. This is a cloud formation syntax. Okay, so you can learn cloud formation while you're using the serverless framework. So it's cool. You can learn both topics at the same time. Okay, I also wrote down about JSON to YAML. Uh, in case this is the first time you are encountering, encountering this uh, YAML, because okay, this was uh, new to me before I started working you know, as a DevOps consultant and stuff. 
Uh, I assume that most of you know what's JSON, you know, just a way to represent uh, information. And using YAML is very simple and easier. This is why we maintain our infrastructure as YAML. Also, uh, a lot of other frameworks use YAML files instead of JSON files. And also using YAML file allows you to put comments in the YAML file, unlike JSON where you can't put comments in the file. So serverless framework is working with a YAML file and also in my CloudFormation templates, I use YAML files. Okay, so forget about JSON when you're talking about serverless framework, you better use YAMLs. And you see here YAML, Y-A-M-L. This can also be YAML like Y-M-L, okay, YAML file. All right, moving on to Rolling updates is the same as updating a CloudFormation stack, which means if I want to update, okay, let's take this uh, CloudFormation stack. If I take this CloudFormation stack and I want to update this CloudFormation stack, it's the same as just clicking on update and then deciding whether I want to, you know, use the current template and just update uh, the values or even just totally replace the current template. So it's the same. Okay, so it's cool because you just roll out updates to the same stack that you have in CloudFormation, which is amazing. Uh, you can add resources and outputs just like you do in a CloudFormation template. But what are resources and outputs? If you look in a CloudFormation, you have here resources and outputs. So once you create something in AWS like this, like let's take something that you are probably familiar with, an S3 bucket. Okay, S3 bucket, probably most of you know it if you work with AWS. Then... We have here this bucket, and if you want to see some outputs, like I'm not sure I have here something. I want to show you some meaningful outputs, so I'll take this one for example, okay? So resources, let's take this S3 bucket, okay, the to-do bucket for example, and then in the outputs, you can see the I did this output, which is the to-do bucket name. I wrote this, and this is the bucket name. So eventually, this is the resource in AWS, and if you want, you can do stuff. You know, you can put in the outputs uh, relevant info that can be used maybe in other stacks or maybe just for ease of use, you know, if you want to use it for yourself. You just want to look at the outputs and look what's some information that came from the resources, you can put it in your outputs. So you can also do that with, with serverless framework. Available objects, uh, we already covered that, so I'm not gonna just, you know, uh, speak uh, again. This is just a detail, some details about the objects. I'm just gonna talk about the events. Eventually, if you wanna trigger a Lambda function, you can, you can use uh, events that you have in AWS. For example, some, wait, hold on, I will just show you. For example, uh, get post, uh, to the API gateway. And I'm gonna say a few words about the API gateway for those of you who don't, don't know it. If a new record was entered to your DynamoDB table, a S3 object was added or removed, you can even set cron jobs. And all of these events are triggers to your Lambda functions. Okay, so let's just start with a very, very, very basics just to make sure everyone is aligned about the uh, terminology. A Lambda function eventually is just a code that runs in a, in a container that is provided by AWS, repeating a Lambda function, okay, a Lambda function is your code depending on, your, uh, on the language that you write it, you know, if it's Python, Node.js, or any other language that is supported by AWS, that you just, let's get inside to one of them. And of course the code over here is generated, you know, you can see here that it's a bit scrambled because I used Webpack to pack my code, but eventually the code, okay, I will show you the source code. So you'll, re you'll really see that the to-do API, the, if I go to SRC and I go to, what was it here? This is the get, yeah. So the get is generated with Webpack and we'll also get to that. The get function, okay, get file over here, is generated with Webpack to this. And this is my code, so I don't touch any infrastructure, I don't care about any server, I don't do anything like that. I just created my function, and serverless framework created for me my API gateway, and you can consider API gateway as your router. Okay, we can see it over here. This can trigger my Lambda function, 
okay? When I say router, I mean you can think about Nginx or maybe even uh, Elastic Load Balancer, like uh, Application Load Balancer and stuff like that. So you just supply a route where you want to invoke the function, it goes to the API gateway and then it invokes the relevant Lambda function. No servers, okay? This is why it's serverless. This is the amazing, amazing thing about it. Okay, going back to the presentation and going back a bit, sorry for the jumps, but I think it's better, you know, that I just show it logically instead of what I did over here. So Lambda functions we saw over here, like how it's scrambled. This is a screenshot of this, okay? And Lambda functions, this, is easily generated by just supplying a few words in a YAML file, okay? So just to be clear how this appears in AWS, okay? How this was automatically generated and following that, we are going to go through line by line of a serverless YAML. So we'll see what does it mean. And of course, we'll also talk about how to install serverless um, CLI, okay? so. First of all, just to create a Lambda function, all I had to do is give it a name and say which file, okay, this is a file name and which function in that file is going to be invoked, that, that's the handler. Okay, so we can see the file name and then the function name, that's the handler, you can see it in AWS over here, okay, index.getItem, file name is here, index.js, I know it's very, very small, but bear with me on that. A package will get to that and events is the trigger. So here you can see in a YAML file, just so we are clear about how a YAML file works, okay, because I didn't speak about that. Uh, everything that you see in here are like objects, okay? We can see it maybe if we just compare like this. So see, this is a dictionary, okay? Everything in here is a dictionary. If you want to do a list, okay, just to do a list, you just apply it with dashes. So an array or a list is this. And each time you do the uh, indentation like I did, hold on, I will show you over here, indentation over here. This means that this is a keyword and inside that keyword we have another object, right? And this is a key and another object with a key and a value, okay? This is how the YAML file works. We'll see a lot of that later on, you'll get the idea of it. But in the events, we can see that I have a list. How do I know it's a list? Because I have a dash over here. So this is only one event that can trigger the get item function. But eventually I can put many, many, many events and it doesn't have to be only HTTP. When I say HTTP, this is translated to the API gateway. Okay, this is in AWS. In other cloud providers, this might not be AW, um, API gateway. It might be another service for that other cloud provider. So I define that I want to trigger it with an HTTP event and the path that I want it to be invoked with, you know, the to do, get, and then supply the ID and the method it's gonna use, okay? Which is also just get, you know, makes sense. Get is method get. <clears throat> okay, so I covered all of that, but still I feel something is missing because we are talking about the serverless framework. So what is a serverless framework? What does it mean? If you wanna go and just install it right now, the CLI, you can go to the official website of serverless framework, which is serverless.com. And then since we're using AWS, I will just go through the process with you. Uh, let's say I go to serverless.com. They have a, an amazing website. You go to the docs and then provider CLI references, AWS. And here you can see all of the stuff. Uh, since it's not so easy to just get started, this is why we're having this webinar. So we'll just walk through and see how to use this website well and how to use all of the events and stuff like that. So installation, okay? You need to have Node installed. So they say you need to have, uh, it's a Node CLI tool. So you can install it with NPM. For those of you who are using Yarn, you can use Yarn Global Ed and then install serverless uh, framework. Okay, you don't have to use uh, only NPM. I usually use Yarn, this is why I just talked about Yarn. And then it will install globally serverless CLI on your machine. And then we can just start deploying our code. But what is deploying our code? What are we deploying? So we are deploying a serverless YAML 
and the serverless YAML, okay, serverless YAML file is looking for stuff in our GitHub repository or any other Git repository that we will deploy. For example, okay, just for example, when I wrote here um, package artifact and then I did this, so the serverless YAML is looking for this file and then it's gonna deploy this file. So in this file, the files that we have in this uh, zip file are index.js and index.js.map. Now, I'm talking a lot about Node, but this is also relevant for those of you who are using Python, Ruby, or any, any programming languages that uh, AWS supports, but I suggest that you uh, look in the serverless framework support for runtimes, okay, because the fact that something is supported in AWS doesn't mean it's supported in the serverless framework. Usually it does, okay, but just to make sure, if you want to use serverless framework, check the docs about the available runtimes for your AWS, for your cloud provider. Okay, a lot of talking, which I hate it. I just like to explain stuff, you know, practically. So let's jump to the GitHub repository. And again, just to keep you in context, I will send you the link to this GitHub repository. And if you're wondering why my GitHub is looking so weird, it's because I'm using Octo3 and I chose the, you know, you're used to see this, but just to make it easy on the eyes, I like to use this. Okay, just in case you wonder what's going on over here. And looking at this GitHub repository, let's see how it's built, okay? Just zooming out a bit, just see how it's built. First of all, I have this file serverless common YAML, okay? Which I'll probably use uh, um, when I have a big application which has multiple services, okay? So what does it mean? Maybe I need to go inside services to really understand what it means. So if I go to the services folder, I can see here I have two services. Now, what do you mean by services? Well, how do you split them? So you can see here the logic, okay? We, each service, from my perspective, is an API. For example, the to-do API is a service. This service contains, can contain multiple functions like get, read, create, update, list, whatever. This service only contains one function, for example, and also it's in Python, so look how amazing it is. In the same GitHub repository, I go into services, I have two different folders. This one is written in Python, this one is written in TypeScript, okay, and they both work with serverless, so you can run you can use multiple runtimes. So if you have different use cases, like you want to do some machine learning or stuff like that, you can use Python. You want to write some backend or frontend, you can do uh, with the TypeScript, you know, JavaScript, which is great. So looking at the to-do API folder, let's see what we have here. Finally, this is a service, okay? Each service needs to have a serverless YAML file. Okay, so that's the basics. If you want to create... Uh, from scratch, you know, just create an application from scratch and it's very, very small. You might even only have this folder, okay? SRC is the uh, uh, folder of your code, okay? So SRC, if I go in here, you'll see my TypeScript code. And I don't really care about the TypeScript code. We are not here to learn about the code. We are here to learn about the infrastructure. I just want to go into, let's say, get, and you can see here that... We have, uh, we have imported uh, some library from AWS and I'll get to that and importing, um, and importing uh, uh, some other uh, modules. And I have a question over here, like what's the yarn.log file? So yarn.log file really reminds me the requirements.txt file in Python. If you look in here, it's, it's scrambled, okay? Since I'm not using NPM, I'm using yarn. So yarn makes my, you can see it in the packet JSON, yarn is, is uh, setting the versions of each package that I installed. Okay, so this is the yarn log file, in case you wonder what it is. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Webpack and uh, TypeScript. Um, all right. So uh, let's go inside the serverless YAML to really understand what's going on, right? And just to be clear for 100% of what we are going to do here, we're going to go through 
each line to understand what's like what like each word in here each reserved keyword each keyword over here and the main purpose of this to do API is just to act as a simple uh, crud application okay even a crud ul crud l application which is create read update delete and also list if you wonder I will just show you here what it does you can go to the goal right we have here two services first one is this to do API and to make it simple I didn't want to work with a database so I created a, an S3 bucket, okay, which will be my database. And the contents um, are saved to the object's user-defined metadata. So just to be clear, each time I'm creating a to-do, okay, an item, it creates an object in S3, which is simply a file, okay, it's an object. And I save the content of the to-do in the objects metadata which is in s3 it's the user defined metadata you can read more about it over here so instead of saving it in the body of the object i save it in the user defined metadata it was just simpler to do in typescript okay just in case you wonder why i don't know why, why are you doing it uh, with s3 why not using dynamodb or a real database i just wanted to make it simple okay so moving on to the serverless yaml Let's read it together and really understand. I even wrote a lot of comments over here, you know, to understand what, 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 what's everything, but either way, we're going to read it together and really understand what's going on. So if it's leftmost, then it's a reserved keyword. So service, package, plugins, this, all of these are reserved keywords by the serverless framework. So you're not allowed to put your own keywords over here. Okay, if it's leftmost, keep in mind it's a reserved keyword. Great, now service. We are using the reserved keyword service. The service is the stack name in cloud formation. To make it even more accurate, when I say stack name in cloud formation, this also includes the stage. Okay, serverless framework um, is great because it teaches you from the beginning that each stack or each infrastructure that you deploy you need to provide a stage. By stage, I mean dev, staging, and production. Okay, and even QA, test, whatever you have. So you need to provide a stage. So in this example, I'm only working on dev. So you'll see always, you can see here in my stacks, you can see dev, 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 dev. This is added automatically, okay? Automagically even, all right? And how was it added? Okay, I just wanna go and, and show you how I deployed this application, uh, this application so you really understand how this CLI of serverless framework is working, okay? So we, from our command line, we just write this simple command. Instead of SLS, you can write down serverless, okay? This, it's the same, just, just an alias to serverless. So you write down serverless, deploy, and then you supply any argument that you want. One of the arguments, arguments that you can supply are the stage, okay? So here, I to deploy this, uh, this stack, I wrote down in my command line, serverless, deploy, and then I provided a stage. We'll get to that. I just wanted to keep, to, you know, so you have some context, where did this dev came from? So this is why you see here dev, 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 dev. And we'll see in just a few minutes how we use this, uh, this variable, okay? Because this is a variable that I provided on runtime, okay? Okay, so a service wraps up everything. You can think about it as your whole API. Okay, pack it in individually, we'll touch it later on because it's a bit complicated and you know, I'll do it once you know the basics. Plugins, we'll all, we'll, I'll talk about it right now, but we'll also touch it more later on. Serverless framework, you know, if you wonder why to use serverless framework and not SAM CLI or maybe Terraform or, or any other infrastructure as code service that any other provider is providing, then serverless framework has tons of plugins, tons. I mean, you have a huge plugin library. So if I go to serverless framework plugins, you can see that it has 
tons of plugins with ratings, you know, GitHub repositories, and it's very easy to understand what you need because, you know, you can just see it over here, you know, serverless slash plugins. You, you'll see that it has tons of useful plugins and it's great because it has a very, very big community. And the plugins that I'm using in this uh, serverless YAML file are serverless sudo parameters and serverless latest layer, layer version. And I think we'll get to that later so you'll understand why I add them, okay? So it's not important right now, we'll get to that. Framework version is the version of the CLI that you are using. Currently the serverless framework CLI, you know, the application, I think the latest is 1.64, I'm not sure. You can just check it out by downloading it and then see which is the latest version or just go to the GitHub repository and see the, the release. You know, it's, it's on GitHub, so it's very easy to see. If I go to serverless and then I go to the release, right, releases. So now we have uh, the latest version is 1.69. So what I'm saying here, you can only deploy this stack if you are running 1.1.0 and lower than version two. Why do we have it to like, if somebody uses version two point whatever, and then they say, hey, this doesn't work. So we can tell them, please use only these versions, you know, bigger than this and smaller than this. Okay, maybe to even make it better, I would put it like uh, 1.56 uh, because I don't remember when I used 1.1, it's very old. Okay, custom. See here, we have the manage your values here, no reserved keywords here. So here we have the word custom and under custom, I can define any key that I want, you know, any keyword that I want. Common mappings, I decided to call it common mappings. To do bucket name, this is a name that I gave it, okay? And I also wrote it down, the database, okay? Again, I'm leaving it also. I wanna to touch the provider. Okay, first I want to explain about the provider, which is the core thing about serverless framework. And then I'm going to dive in what's, uh, ba, ba, ba. no, switching. Keeping it on custom because we are using a lot of mappings and then I'll jump to provider. Sorry for confusion. Okay, so custom. And then I have here common mappings. This is something that I decided to use. And this is like a, a best practice that I use. Okay, if I have a lot of values that are shared between my, keep in mind, services, okay, between my services, reminding you to do API as a service, Grit API as a service. So I use this common mappings keyword, and then I reference to a file. Now it says importing common, common values, but what does it mean? Let's see. This, when, when you see this, uh, you know, dollar sign and then curly braces, this means uh, uh, we're using some syntax of the serverless framework, okay? So for example, I have here a function from the serverless framework, which is named file. Okay, that's the syntax of it. This is how you use it. And then you give it uh, uh, a relative, a relative uh, path relative to the serverless YAML file. Okay, hold on just one second. you give it a relative path to your serverless uh, uh, YAML. Okay, so we can see here if we are in the serverless, uh, if we are near the serverless YAML file and we tell it go up and up, right? I go up and up. So eventually I'm here, right? If I look here, okay. I mean that to do API, so I tell it to go to the services and then I go to the main deer and then I go to this file. But what is this file? What is it? I can only say, see here that in this file, I'm referencing to the word custom. Okay, so let's look in the common YAML file, serverless common YAML file to see what's under custom. Interesting. I look at the serverless common YAML. Remember I showed it to you like a few minutes ago when we started? Um, I told you about it and I told you we'll get back to it. So here we are. And here I'm referencing, referencing to the custom keyword. Okay. So in the custom keyword, you can see a lot of values over here. For example, under custom, you have app name and this application's name is serverless template and you have memory size. And then I define the memory size for Lambda functions per uh, stage. So local is if you're running it locally and we'll get to that. We'll talk about 
if you can even run serverless locally and dev staging production and which runtime you use i think that usually you just use the same runtime for all environments it was just for an example if to use require api key if you're using cloud phone distribution which origins to allow uh, from your api gateway on which region you deploy here i deployed everything in, in ireland you know eu west one and if you have a user pool ID and stuff like that. So you can share values between your services and you can even map it per stage. Okay, that's a very good practice to map it per stage. So like get me the memory size for dev. So it's uh, 128, okay? The, the memory size of the Lambda function that are gonna, going to run. Maybe in production, I would want it to be 100, 192 or maybe 256 and stuff like that, okay? That, that's why we have the mapping spare stage. So this is the serverless common YAML, right? Now, going back here just to show you, I can omit this custom, okay? You see here the colon and then custom? This means I'm referencing, referencing to this. Why did I do it like that? Why didn't I just put everything as root, you know, everything um, indent, without any indentation, without any keyword above it? Why did I put this custom? in this file and made it a bit uh, more, I don't know, um, complicated. Because maybe if I want to create another, you know, maybe in here, in the custom, I want to create a, a reference to another, um, another uh, a keyword in the same file, I can add, for example, this is custom, because it's for the custom mappings. Maybe I want to add some other keyword. So now it's, it's more granular, you know, you can reference to custom, and then add another keyword, you know, or that is uh, most left and reference to that. Okay, so this is just for granularity. Uh, it's more flexible. So referencing to custom, this also means I don't, when I, when I reference to custom mappings, I don't need each time when I go to custom mappings, I don't need to, to mention that I'm going to custom because I did it over here. So next time I'm going to use custom mappings, it's, it's gonna go directly to all of the attributes over here. So how do you really use it? You know, how do you really reference to it? Take, uh, well, let's not take this for example because this is the import value. Let's move on to, to the provider and then we'll see how do I use the common mappings. All right, so after I'll go over this, I'll ask again if there are more questions. You know, you can shoot questions to the chat. We also have the, some guys from, uh, from ProDops, they can assist or I can tell you what's going on. So provider, everything under provider is a reserved keyword, uh, environment layers, you know, name, runtime, everything here is a reserved keyword. You don't invent anything. You need to do it according to the documents, right? So the name of the provider is AWS. This is also a reserved keyword. You know, if it's a Google uh, cloud, maybe it should be GCP. I don't know, you just need to check in the docs. The runtime, remember in the serverless common YAML, we had a runtime. Remember we had, where is it here, runtime? Okay, let's see how I get this value. I'm saying this specific value because I'm on dev, okay? So, again, when I see a dollar sign and then curly braces, I know that I'm going to use the serverless framework syntax. So what is this self? Very easy to understand because self says this file. Okay, when I say this file, I mean this serverless YAML file. Okay, so now I'm refer referencing to this same file. So it says in this file, go to custom. Okay, so it goes to this file and then searches for the keyword custom. It's here, okay, great. Under custom, go to common mappings, which is this. In custom mappings, go to runtime. Okay, so in common mappings, go to runtime, it's here. Now I need to decide which stage I wanna get, right? And it should be something dynamic. I don't wanna hard code anything. So, here you can see, this is like a nested reference. Here you can see I'm also referencing to something which is called self and then provider and then stage. So this means go to the same file, you know, this file, go to provider, go to the stage of the provider and get, it, get, get this value. So eventually this should be like custom common mappings runtime and then dev. Okay, and if you're doing on staging, so it'll be staging or production or whatever. All right, but how did you really get this stage? I mean, you talked about putting it like this, 
but how do you really read it? You know, how do you read this uh, argument that you supply on runtime when you deploy your, uh, your stack? Well, it's very simple because you have another keyword, which is opt. I think it's an acronym for uh, options, okay? And we just say, give me the stage that was provided when you executed the serverless deploy and then the keyword. This doesn't have to be specifically stage. If you have something that is related to your specific application, let's say I'm, I don't know, uh, like dash dash and then AI equals to true, for example. You can supply any flag, any, any optional argument and then use it. So how do you use it? Dollar sign, curly braces, opt, colon, and then the keyword, you know, the argument that you supplied and then you'll get the value that you supplied on runtime, okay? Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so I'll assume I'm not talking to myself and people are still here because I can see that people are still here. Um, moving on, okay, since uh, no questions. So I saw that I can reference to the same file. I saw that I can uh, get the arguments that you get that are supplied on runtime. Let's see, let's see the region. Okay, region is where we deploy this stack. Where do you want to deploy it? Uh, so referencing, referencing to the same file, serverless YAML, custom, common mappings, region, wait, 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 region, it's uh, here, region, and then I need to provide a stage. So the stage again is provider stage. Now, some might ask or wonder, why do you always reference to provider.stage? Why not simply use here the opt and then stage? Why do you always reference to the provider? because I want to maintain my stage in one place because then if I will do some other manipulation or something like that, I will not have to change it in every place that I wanted to reference to the stage. You know, so if I want to change the stage and I want it to be in, you know, to get, uh, forgot the word, but, but I wanted to get effect like uh, to apply to all of the other references to the stage, I can just change it here and it will change in the other uh, references, which is great. So this is why I'm referencing all, always to the provider stage. And that's also a very good practice because it saves you a lot of time of copy pasting in case you decide to change some argument or something like that. Okay, so region, same goes for memory size. I think we got it. Just bear in mind that memory size, this is not by accident. This is a, uh, it's a case sensitive. Okay, it's a reserved keyword, it's case sensitive. Environment, environment variables that will be available in the function. So that's amazing. I can define here. Um, I will compare serverless framework and Terraform in a second. Meanwhile, okay, meanwhile, if you want to look at that, you have here uh, serverless framework versus Terraform. I can just show you. They have it in the docs, okay? So in case you want to see comparisons, you can just look here. This is why they're just amazing. They thought about everything, you know, no matter what you'll ask, we probably have it in the docs. Okay, so you can read this. And you know what, it's even better. I'd say read this if you have more questions like why I decided to use serverless framework, I think you'll see it once we dive deep and see the more details about the serverless framework. Because right now, you can think of, of Terraform as like, um, you know, it's, uh, it's even more granular because it's not using uh, cloud formation, but to remind you serverless framework is using cloud formation only in AWS. In other cloud providers, it uses the relevant service or relevant thing to create a stack, you know? Um, so maybe we'll dive deep in serverless and then you'll see why it's, I won't say better, but easier to use than Terraform if you are handling uh, serverless architecture. Okay, I would use Terraform mainly to maintain a big architecture like Kubernetes, uh, you know, ECS or any, anything that is very, very complicated when it comes to the infrastructure. But when I want to create a serverless application, which has a DynamoDB a database, uh, S3 bucket or anything like that, I will use the serverless framework. This is what guides me through. Okay, so I hope that answered your question. 
regarding the environment keyword, all right? Environment. This means that all of the functions below, just to show you the functions, okay? Scrolling down, you see here the function, that's also a reserved keyword. This is a function, this is a function, this is a function, okay? And all of the functions below will have the same environment variables, okay? This is like, you can think about it um, as inheritance, you know, most of you know um, uh, object-oriented, I hope so, uh, since you're developers and stuff. So all of the functions and all of the rest of the file, you know, okay, all of the functions are just inheriting everything from the provider. So if I decided to put here memory size, this is the default memory size for all of the functions. If later on I want a specific function function to have its own memory size, I can do that. Same goes for the environment, okay? Same goes for the IAM role statements, which we'll get to that, you know? Everything that you have in provider is like the default value for all of the functions. And eventually, if you want to specify a specific thing for a specific function, for example, uh, this function uses this specific layer, even though we don't know what's a layer, or uses this specific role, okay? Even though we defined that the default role for all of the function is this, right? So everything in, in provider is inherited by the functions, all right? So envir environment, and I wanna show you, I, I like to always show in the UI, you know, just so you get the context of what we're showing here. So environment, then you can see stage, again, self wider stage, region, see here in region, I didn't refer to custom mappings, blah, blah, I referred to self provider region. To those bucket name, I didn't refer to the same reference that I did over here, you know, used an, an import function, we'll get to that. I used like self custom to those bucket. I got it from the serverless YAML file, okay? Let's see it in the UI. Let's go to the functions. I want to go to the create function because it has more stuff in it. It's in services, lambda, okay? And then I just search for serverless. I got here all of the functions that I deployed. And then I go to create. If I just scroll down a bit, I can see here the environment variables. So you can see region, stage, and the to-do's bucket name, which is our database. Okay, so all of the functions, all of the functions by default. Okay, let's take another one. Let's take uh, the list. All of the functions are going to have the same environment variables. Think how powerful it is. I just declared it once over here and suddenly all of the functions below have it. You know, it's amazing. Okay, moving on to IAM role statements. This is the default role for each function. It allows logging only. So by default, serverless framework provides each function, you know, any function to deploy this role, okay? And this role just allows logging to uh, CloudWatch. And if you wonder, like, what, what do you mean, like, logging to CloudWatch? So if you go, if you go to the function itself, and then you go to, let's take maybe a function that I, I already invoked, right? So maybe I think I tried the create, and you go to monitoring, I hope I have some information here, if not, well. Okay, so I have some invocation over here, right? And then I can view in CloudWatch logs. So this is basically the only role that this function has um, by default. So even if I don't, okay, even if I don't include this statement, this is the default uh, role that each function has. Why did I put it here if it's the default? So you can see and understand what it has. Okay, just in case you wonder. And here I can look in the CloudWatch logs, you know, what happened? You know, I can see, it, it depends on what I decided to log. If I use the console log, I will see all the console log over here. In Python, it's print. So everything that is printed, you see over here. In uh, JavaScript, it's console log, right? You can see it over here. I didn't do console log. This is just like, a, this is like the in, info of the event. I think I did console log on the event in my function. And then you can see everything that is, you know, came from the event of the function. When you learn more about uh, Lambda function, you'll understand what it means. I'm not gonna dive too deep to that because I wanna focus on the infrastructure. And I'm back, okay. Default role for each function, great. API gateway. So what's the API gateway? Reminding you, that's the router. Now, 
API gateway that was previously created in AWS resources. So, I usually create an API gateway before I create a service. Okay, before. But why do you say it like before and why, why do you mean it? Why do you say it like that? Because if I decide to omit, okay, to delete this uh, API gateway, serverless framework will automatically create an API gateway for me, for this specific service. Reminding you, a serverless YAML is per service, okay? So if I decide to delete this, then I will get an API gateway. And this means, if you think about it, that each service will have its own API gateway, okay? Now, I don't want to do that, not because it costs more money, because it's harder to manage, okay? For me, it's easier to have one API gateway, one router, especially if it's for the same application, you know, I don't want to have tons of resources that I don't know what's their purpose. And I'll just show you, you know, we're talking and talking, but can we just see it? So here is my API gateway. Everything is in Ireland, okay? Just in case you wonder. And you see here admin at my AWS account because I'm not using my root user, I'm using a role, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using a user, you know, a user that I created and I gave it admin permissions. This is why you see it over here. And if I go to this, this is the API gateway that I created. I also, by the way, gave it, uh, hold on, I want to show you the name of how it appears over here. I gave this API gateway its name, okay? I, I, I'm not sure about that, but I think that if you uh, let serverless framework to generate for you an API gateway, it, it just puts, you know, a random name, okay? So I think it's better to create on your own to have a name according to your convention, okay? To According to your naming convention. So... If I get inside, I can see here that both Todo API and Grid API are using the same router, the same API gateway. Okay, so you're saying that you're using the same API gateway, but how do you do that? So I created the API gateway before I deployed uh, this uh, stack, and then I imported the values of REST API ID and REST API blah blah of the API gateway. What is this import? You know, why do I need to, to do that? Okay, so to use an existing API gateway, you must provide these two. This means that when I create the API gateway in another stack, I need to put in the outputs. I need to put, you know, something that will be imported in this stack. This is also relevant to, let's go up, the to-dos bucket. Okay, to, 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 to the to-dos bucket. Remember here, I also, I told you, okay, we'll get back to that. So here, here it is again, you know, I'm importing something. So this will be in the outputs of another stack. So how did I do it? You know, what, how did I decide to take, what's the approach of doing it? So any, any resource that is not part of the code, you know, it's not part of the serverless framework and I'm using it, I love to put it in the AWS resources folder. This is the folder that I named, you know, you can just name it resources or infrastructure or whatever, okay? And I deployed it, you know, even the resources over here, I didn't go and create them manually, dear God, no. I created them with the serverless framework. In case you wonder why do we have the CFN API gateway and CFN S3, this is just to show you that I could also deploy those resources with uh, CloudFormation. You know, I didn't have to use the serverless framework, right? But I decided to use the serverless framework. Let's get inside, okay? So if you want, you can go to the main uh, folder of this repository and just go to AWS resources and see the serverless YAML file. See, I'm here. And let's see how I deployed, reminding you, two resources, right? API Gateway, an S3 bucket. Why did you deploy the S3 bucket? Well, I deployed it because this is our database. This is a to-dos bucket database, okay? I need to use it for my application. Any questions so far? Okay, so just send the something in the chat just to see, because I see we have people here, which is great. So just... You know, show a sign of life. Okay. 
Thank you, Arya. Yeah, if you think uh, Arya's name, you know, this person's name is biblical, you know, it's because in, it's, it's in Hebrew. So in case you read it then. All right. So I'm in the AWS resources folder and I see the serverless YAML, right? Now I want to deploy some resources that are not specifically part of my application, but my application is using them, right? So I named this stack serverless template resources, okay? And I want to show you this stack, okay? You see here CloudFormation and this is the stack, okay? You can see here resources, you see I have the API gateway, which is type REST API. And I'm saying type REST API because we have AWS has um, another type of uh, API gateway, which is also um, HTTP. It's quite new. So I do suggest that you use the REST API unless you have a specific need for the HTTP. REST API will answer all your needs. Um, the AWS claims that it's a bit more expensive than um, uh, the API, um, sorry, the HTTP API. Um, okay, good to know that there are no questions. Okay, so I created the to-do bucket and I'm showing you really how I'm reading it because eventually if I wanna know which type it is, I'm looking at the type, you know, I'm going to the stack, going to resources, then type and then, because this doesn't mean anything to me, you know, physical ID, okay, so that's probably something like the ARN, you know, the Amazon resource name or the logical ID, no idea what it says. Maybe I'll know later on status. I don't care. I want to know which type it is. So S3 bucket, this is the bucket that I've created and REST API, this is the API gateway. When I say API, I mean this, you know, we, we saw that, okay? This is like the 898Q95. Uh, we don't see that, yeah, hold on. We can see it in the outputs, 8Q95, whatever. And if I actually click on it, I think it will take me to the same API gateway page. And yes, it did, amazing. Okay, so these are the resources of the stack. Let's see how we did it. We already know this, we already know this. Again, referencing for the common mappings, provider AWS, runtime is the same, though if you think about it, we don't really need the runtime over here because we are not deploying any function. We are only deploying resources, right? Stage, we got it already. Region, we got it already. So what's this reserved keyword? How do I know that it's a reserved keyword? Because as I said, all of the keywords that are left most, you know, that are um, don't have any indentation and are in the root file are reserved keywords. So any resource or any, any syntax that you want to insert that is related to CloudFormation, for example, resources, this is the reserved keyword of CloudFormation. Okay, so if you don't know CloudFormation, it's good that you start learning it now, okay, and you're using AWS, so you should learn about it, okay? Resources is a reserved keyword, and also, by the way, this is indented, in case you wonder, under resources, and also outputs is under resources. Now, this might be a bit confusing, okay, because we have the resources with a lowercase, and then resources with uppercase, and outputs, okay? so. Resources with lowercase, this is for the serverless framework. Under here, okay, below this, you put everything that is related to CloudFormation as you would create it in CloudFormation. Great. So how did I create something in CloudFormation? So since we are not going to really learn about CloudFormation, I'm just going to go through, you know, a bit, okay? So this is the name that I gave it. This will be the logical ID. Hold on, what's logical ID? Going here. You see here, logical ID, API Gateway REST API, API Gateway REST API, great. What type it is, is it? Uh, you know, we, we talked about it, REST API. And then some properties, and remember I gave it a beautiful name, which is my application name, serverless template, dash REST, REST dash API, dash dev, which is, which is, hold on, serverless template, REST API dev, see, it's here. And I gave it a tag, blah, blah. And I also created a bucket. I named this on my own, right? To do bucket. It, what, what type is this resource? It's an S3 bucket. When you delete the stack, also delete this bucket um, if it's not empty. Okay, it's important to remember that we'll only delete a bucket if it's not empty. Properties, I'm denying, okay? It looks like uh, this bucket is uh, public and stuff, but public access block configuration, okay? So this means I'm blocking any access to the this S3 bucket. 
and I also gave it some tag, even though I think a serverless framework puts, put tags on your resources, so I don't really think it's necessary, it was just to give you an example how to tag your resources. And this is how I created my resources in CloudFormation. You know, if you go to the CloudFormation templates that we have over here, you'll see the same, you know, it, it's copy paste. It's the exact same code. Now, the outputs, okay? This is very important to understand how do you use the outputs. Just to be clear, I told you this is the logical ID, but this is also the name that you'll use when you want to reference to a resource that you've created in this template. So if I named it here API Gateway REST API and I named it here to do bucket, then if I go to the outputs, for example, and I wanna use those resources uh, um, attributes, I can just, for example, I need the API Gateway REST API root resource ID. Remember I told you API Gateway blah, blah. Why do I need it? Hold on, hold on. Going back, okay, going back to the serverless YAML to see why do I want to output this. If I go to my API gateway, I, need, I see here that I have the REST API blah blah, right? So if I'm going to import it over here, I need to export it over here, okay? So output, and then I get, you know, since I'm, again, I'm not teaching uh, cloud formation, just quick. So get the attribute of the API gateway REST API, which is this resource, get the attribute of root resource ID, and then, I want you to export it, okay? But what do you mean by export? Wait, wait, wait. Let's go to CloudFormation. Go to Outputs. We have two different uh, things that we can do with the outputs. Either we can have a normal output like these, okay? Or we can export names of the outputs. So if you want to import your stuff, uh, your, I don't know, your outputs, in another stack, you should use export, okay? It makes your job easier, you just export it, and then in another, in another stack, you can import it. Just to give you a quick example, in the serverless framework, right, we imported something that was exported from the AWS resources stack, okay? So, how do you do that? Okay, Go, you can see it over here, I gave it, I gave it some, you know, meaningful names. You can see the names over here. Okay, sub, uh, this is how you use uh, uh, functions in CloudFormation, okay? So there is a built-in function, sub, I think it stands for substitute. And then I put it in double quotes, so it will be clear that it's a string. And I took the application name, which is serverless framework, and then I hard-coded the API gateway, blah, blah, dash, stage, okay? So eventually you'll see here, serverless template, dash, blah, blah, dash, stage, export name. Okay, this is what you just saw. Same goes for the API Gateway REST API ID. I gave it serverless template dash API Gateway REST API ID. Let's see it over here. Um, okay, I think I just confused between the two, but I think you got the idea, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but you understood that we have the API Gateway REST blah blah and API REST API ID. In case you don't, I will repeat, but just send me a message in the chat, but I think you got the idea. I think it's a bit uh, heavy, you know, to repeat it over and over. So you got the idea about exporting and the names. Now, I also put an output for the to-do bucket j just for me, you know, just to get the regional domain name of the bucket. And if you wanna see what's the regional domain name, we can, get, we can go to the cloud formation template and see here, to-do bucket regional domain name. And this is how you can access the bucket. So if I go here and try to access the bucket, I will get access denied. Just to remind you, the bucket is not public. Okay, I blocked any access to the bucket. So this is why I'm getting access denied. The whole idea is to access objects in the bucket with your application. So the backend is protected. Okay, this is like uh, basic security stuff that you can do. I, I don't really think anyone here is gonna use S3 as a dat database, but more as like uh, storing images and documents, but you know, just to get the concept of what we're doing here. So to do bucket regional name, it's just the address of the S3 bucket. So if I made it public, you would be able to see the objects in the bucket. And last but not least, to do bucket name, uh, I reference to the to do bucket resource, which is this. And you see the export name is, server, is serverless uh, template. You know, that's the application name, to do's and then dev. You can see it over here. 
I export this. And then when I want to use in another stack, okay, uh, I can import this name and I will get this value. I will import this name and I will get this value. Same goes for the REST API ID. Okay. So now getting back, okay, getting back after I deployed this stack and in the end we'll, we'll, uh, we'll read through the logs and see how each command, you know, how I deployed the AWS resources and how I deployed the, the layers and how I deployed the functions, how I tested the functions, you know, we'll, we, we'll see how it goes the whole process of deploying it step by step. Okay, so let's say I just deployed it. Okay, I did a serverless deploy uh, dash dash stage equals to dev and I deployed it, okay? And uh, just to keep in mind, when I do my deployments, you need to make sure you are near your serverless YAML file. You can also reference to a file if you are in a different folder, but I do recommend that you do like a, you know, change the, you know, CD, serverless template, CD, uh, AWS resources, and then run the serverless deploy dash dash stage uh, equals dev. Okay, going back to serverless YAML, okay, where we started after we did this whole recursion thing, you know, we see here the to-do's bucket name, we import a value. Which value do we import? Serverless template dash, you know, the, the names that we were exported from the AWS resources. Now, why is it so great? Because we can also import these values in the grid API, right? So if we want to use, for example, the same API gateway, we also use, we will just copy paste it to the grid API service, okay? Which is great. So that's the whole idea of import, export. Any questions about import, export, and sharing those resources? I don't know. Again, I'm stopping for for questions just to give you, you know, your head to 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 so it be, will be calm, you know. So you'll stop hearing me talking. So I'll just be quiet, wait for questions, so you can relax. Yes, Arya. So you can just shoot your questions. Maybe one of my colleagues will. Um, will answer them or I, you know, so just shoot, fire it will. I think, you know, instead of doing a break, we can just have questions. Okay, so regarding CloudFormation, you know, what's CloudFormation? Uh, CloudFormation is a service by AWS, okay? You can see it over here, services CloudFormation. This service allows you to maintain all of your infrastructure as code. If you want to know some other options to do that, you can use the SAM CLI, which also creates uh, CloudFormation stacks. Uh, you can use Terraform, which is also a service to maintain inf infrastructure as code. But eventually, CloudFormation is to maintain your infrastructure as code. If you're not sure what it is, you can just Google it. You know, I Instead of creating stuff manually you know, in the UI, you just write down a few lines of code like these and suddenly, poof, you got your resources up. And if you want to maintain it per environment, so it's very easy to be done using the infrastructure as code. Let's see the other question. And I can see that you also asked about the outputs. I, I think I just explained it. Uh, I you, mainly I use the outputs for the export name, you know, for the exports because I'm going to import them in another stacks. So if you don't, you're not sure what are the outputs, you can use export to import them in another stacks. And if you are not sure what are these, I will get to them in a few minutes. Okay, like what are those outputs that I didn't? I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't put any output in the serverless YAML file over here. You didn't see me putting, you know this and this. So after I answer your questions, I will, I will get to that. And you know, that's an amazing question. Is there a simple way in serverless framework to authorize an API request with Cognito? And magically, yes, there is. And it's super, super, super simple. Okay, super simple. All you gotta do, and I think you'll be shocked. Okay, I wanna show you in the docs how it looks like. All you gotta do, authorize 
Wait, there is this keyword which says authorize. I think it's in the API gateway. Author, yeah, okay. It's, it should be over here. Okay. So when you use the HTTP event, okay, and just in case you wanna go through what I just did, then you just add the word authorizer and then you add the cognito user pool. Okay, and I think there's also a great blog post about it. Okay, hold on. Um, serverless framework authorizer. So mainly you're really looking for the keyword authorizer. Okay, this is how it's called. And I think I saw a great blog post about it where you can use, well, it doesn't have to be Internet of Things. No, it's not good. But there are a lot of, a lot of stuff that you can read about how can I access with Cognito user pool and, uh, and uh, serverless framework. I use it a lot with uh, some of my uh, customers and it's great, okay? It's working flawlessly. It's very easy to use. The only thing you need to do, see, it's like this. You know, you put under the HTTP event authorizer and then the ARN of your user um, uh, pool and that's it, okay? Amazing. I hope that answered your question and you know, if you wanna dive deep, you can just Google more about it. Just look for authorizer. Any other questions before we proceed? Okay, so we talked about uh, import, we talked about export, about outputs, we talked about the API gateway, the roles per function, everything under provider, custom values, blah, blah. Now we got here the keyword layers. Keep in mind, this is indented under provider, okay? I'm still under provider. When I say this, this means all functions will use these layers. So it's just like environment, okay? This means all of the functions will use this, these environment variables, you know, they will have them. So here I can say, I want that all of the functions below will use the same layers, you know, so it's easier to maintain it instead of putting, you know, this in each function like I did over here, you can just put it in the provider and all of the functions will inherit it. But you are talking about layers, but what are layers? Well, again, we'll get to that later on but you can just think of a layer as a dependency. So instead, instead of uh, uh, deploying my Lambda function with all of the packages and dependencies, my Lambda functions are super, super, super slim. You'll see later on how much they weight. They just have two, two files, you know, they're very, very, very small. And my layers are usually big because my layers contain the dependencies. When I say dependencies, let's say you have uh, UUID dependency, you know, UUID package where it generates UUID, you know, a, a universal uh, ID. Okay, so I don't deploy it with my function. I deploy it as a layer and then the function uses that layer. So layers are just packages. And if I want to tell to my functions, please use all functions, please use this layer. And you can see it's a list, right? Because a YAML file, as we said, you can see here the dash. So it's a list of layers. The maximum number of layers that each function can have is five. The maximum amount of, uh, uh, um, the maximum size of the Lambda function plus the layers that it has attached to it uh, is 250 megabytes, okay? Just in case you wonder, 250 megabytes in case I wasn't clear, okay? And finally, we're going to dive into the functions. And before we even continue, I just want to do some, uh, you know, to, to make sure you understand what's going to happen because we have 15 minutes left. Either way, because it's recorded, I'm going to continue until I finish everything that I got. But just to, to keep in mind what's, go what's going to happen. We are going to talk about the functions. We are going to talk about, you know, the packaging. And we are going to talk about the layers, not about how to create them, but how to reference them, to reference to them. And I'm going to go through the uh, uh, all of the CI, you know, the 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 CI CD process that I did that deployed all of this API, you know, the To Do API, Grid API, AWS resources, and the Lambda layers. And we'll read through which commands I used. Okay, so functions, layers, and packages and reading through through the the logs okay this is what we're gonna do hopefully it will be short 
Finally, define your functions here. Reminding you, functions is a reserved keyword because it's leftmost, right? Okay. Name of the function, you name it like this. These are the names that I chose, okay? This is not a reserved keyword. So if we focus on the create function, okay? I'm going to show it in the UI, right? So if we focus on the create function, let's see the name of the create function, how it's named. It's named after my service and then dash, the name you gave it, okay? That's the naming convention, convention by the serverless framework, okay? Service name, dash, the name of the function that you gave it. So if I go, not here, if I go here and I give it the name create, this is why you see here create. Okay, good. Moving on. Handler. We talked about it earlier. Handler says the, the, the package that you uploaded in this function, go to this file in the package, get and use this function in that file. So eventually it's like setting here the handler. Okay, index create item. Great. Role. Remember I talked about uh, resources with capital R, which resides under resources with uh, lowercase r? Hold on. Uh, you see here the to-do create role? Let's scroll down. We got here resources, and I also wrote down here, um, all of your cloud formation stuff goes under resources, including blah, blah. So resources, and then resources with capital R, and then I created all of the roles also in here. Okay, now don't be intimidated. It's not that scary. I just did copy paste for most of them, right? So I named it to do create role. This is the name that I gave it, you know, just like we did to do bucket, whatever. Type AWS IAM role. And then just copy paste this. Uh, this is like uh, the, the default. Remember I said that serverless framework by default provides uh, right access to CloudWatch for your Lambda functions. So this is it. Okay, this is, this is it. This is why I always do copy paste to this. So my Lambda functions will be able to write to CloudWatch to monitor and see what's going on behind the scenes. And the only thing that changes between those roles is this. I just add another effect, you know, another allow, okay, another effect that allows this function to list the bucket and put object. You know, these are just permissions in IAM, okay? And then, I also restrict it per bucket. So I use the join function in CloudFormation and I join this with my to-do bucket name. Okay, so eventually I just get access to everything. I say everything because I see here the asterisks. So I get access to this ARN and this ARN of the bucket is ARN AWS S3 and then the name of the bucket that is this. Okay. Great, so I created the role which has access to create stuff. Uh, you can already understand that the other roles are read, provides only read access and, you know, list, blah, blah. Okay, so this is the role and package, we'll get to it one, once I finish. Same goes for uh, layers, we already went through that, okay? I can define a specific layer for a specific function. I can do up to five, okay? This overwrites the, the layers that I defined in the provider. But here it might look a bit stupid because I gave the same layer here and here. So why did I do it? Just to give you an example, okay? Eventually, like it's useless to put the same layer over here, but I just wanted to show you that you can customize it, you know, put a layer per function. And the events, okay? Now, remember we said uh, in the beginning, okay, I showed you in the presentation over here, I showed you on the get. It's, it's the same over here events, when to trigger this function. And just to be clear, in case you are not uh, familiar with Lambda functions too much, you don't have to invoke a Lambda function with an event. Lambda functions can, all do, can also be invoked manually. Okay, when I say manually, you can actually go here and like click test and provide arguments to the Lambda functions and just invoke it manually. And you can also invoke it manually with, um, uh, uh, you know, the AWS SDK. There is a function in Boto3 for Python and in AWS SDK for TypeScript. For Ruby and whatever, please read the docs. I'm not sure how it works. And you can invoke a function manually. You don't have to trigger it with an event. You know, that's just another way to invoke it. So events, and then look how many lines I added over here. HTTP, 
to do create method post right just want to show you what what this you know what just happened okay when I did this it went to the uh, lambda function you see here it, it added a trigger which is API gateway because we see here the word HTTP so it knows it's an H API gateway in AWS great let's click here let's expand the API gateway and you can see here the resource path is to do create and the method is post so I'm allowing only post okay if you do get you'll get an error so you're only allowed to do post and then this is the resource path and the only thing I had to do to add this trigger is add those few lines which is great because it's very very easy and if you want to see how it looks like in a the API gateway you know just like we did a few seconds ago uh, uh, okay I have it over here we can see it's to do create post right and all of the mechanism that you see over here was simply created by adding those three lines, four lines. Okay, so this is how amazing the servers for MOOC is. Okay, so after we covered all of the events and everything, and I always told you, let's forget about packaging, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Let's first talk if I didn't use this keyword package. Okay, so I didn't use, let's say we don't have this, we don't have, sorry, this, and la 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 la, going up, 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 and this. Okay, let's say we don't use it. So what will the serverless framework do? Okay, what will happen? Serverless framework, if you, if you don't provide the packaging, okay, of how you package your, uh, your, your application, then it will search for the file that you give over here and it will look according to the runtime. Okay, here you can see we, don't, we didn't define any runtime to the function because it inherited from the provider, but this means we're using node because the provider is using node okay provider it's not like cloud provider yeah i'm talking about the provider over here <clears throat> okay so if we don't use packaging then serverless framework needs the path okay again relative path to the index file okay and then it will look okay it will look for uh the package json file all right and in the package JSON file, let's see what it is. If you're coming from Python, that's the requirements file. Okay, I think it's better to explain in Node because Node has dev dependencies and dependencies. So it's more complicated. So the Python users will, will get it and also the Node users will get it. So in Node, you can see here that we have dev dependencies, which are just the packages that I'm using to develop lo locally this application. We also see here scripts, blah, blah, blah. And we can also see the dependencies that our application will use once it's deployed to the cloud. Now, you can see here that I don't use any dependency, but hold on, you just said that, you know, we have dependencies, so why do you use it? Well, all of my dependencies are deployed with the Lambda layers. So my Lambda functions never use dependencies. They always have dev dependencies, or should I say they only have dev dependencies. This means that if you don't use the packaging that I've just talked about, you know, you don't use this, serverless framework automatically, okay, are, is going to the index file. It's going to also read your package JSON file. They should be in the same folder. Okay, the package JSON in the serverless file. And it's going to read and, and see if you have dev dependencies and dependencies. If you have dev dependencies, you'll see a step which says excluding dev dependencies. It's that smart. Okay. And it will also wrap your dependencies if you declared anything in here. Okay. So it will package it. So serverless framework is going to package your dependencies and your source code in the same zip file. This zip file is uploaded to AWS and then it's extra is extracted to an AWS function, okay? Eventually for me, uh, by the way, in the, you know, I'm not sure you're familiar with it. So keep in mind that when I click here, I don't see the function. So you need to click on the function itself. And then I can scroll down. You can see here, I have those two files. This is what I have in my zip file. If I have dependencies, I would have more stuff over here. 
Okay, so we also learned more about, you know, layers a bit and lambda functions. And again, reminding you that you see here a blah blah code and you don't see the real code because this was generated with the Webpack. Okay, great. So, why did I choose to use package? Like I just said that it automatically wraps it and packages it. So why did I choose to use the word package over here and also use the word uh, package individually over here? So let's read package individually. If you set it to true, because by default it's false, this means you are selecting artifacts manually. So you're selecting which zip files to upload to AWS manually. This means that if I use package individually up there, all of my functions need to declare the package artifact. I could also use the package individually per function, you know, but every time I use serverless framework, I always use the package and then artifact. So why did I choose to use that? Why am I doing it? Because for my experience, it takes more time to remember the step that I told you, excluding dev dependencies. Okay, so this step takes a while, okay? And other than that, I had some uh, uh, bad experience of uh, using a Webpack plugin and serverless framework, and I'm using Webpack a lot. So since I'm using Webpack, and even if you don't know Webpack, okay, I don't really care if you know or not, but because I love to package things on my own in my customizable, customizable way, okay? Then I love to use this like Webpack config.js. I wrote it down uh, and I use it in every project that I use. Uh, Webpack config and the Babel config, the TS config, everything suits to all of my projects. So this is why I decided to have this uh, artifact dist to do. Just to, to keep in mind, this means that all, okay, all of my packages, all of, sorry, all of my functions are using the same zip file. But each time the zip file, you know, inside the zip file, I have the same index.js file, okay? I have the same index.js file. This file contains all of my functions. So you might wonder, but why are you deploying the same file? You know, if you can think about it, the, the, the create function has this index.js and also all the other functions, okay? All the other functions of to-do have the same index.js file, okay? It's the exact same code you see over here. Why am I willing to compromise and using the same zip file with all of my uh, uh, functions? Because it's so small, okay? And there is no way anyone is gonna use the other functions because the handler is this. So unless I'm keeping something super secret in my function, and, and I guess it won't be in my function, it's probably gonna be in a secret, you know, and not in my function. So I'll use a parameter store or secrets manager or stuff like that then it's okay to share okay, the same package, the same zip file that you see over here with all of the functions, especially if it's light. Okay, it's not like I'm including the, the dependencies of this and dependencies of this, and then both of them are going to be very heavy and blah, blah. So I think you got the idea. I decided to do it, the, the packaging manually, but you can omit it and see if it suits to your needs, right? So. For starters, don't use this uh, uh, package and artifact and the in package individually. I say start with, you know, removing them and then see how it goes. Okay, so that's the packaging. Regarding the layers, I said I also dive into the layers. So what we have left is going through layers a bit and then reading the, um, the logs, okay, of how everything was deployed. So layers. I decided to put a specific layer to the create function. We already said that. All of the functions over here also have the layer, uh, this layer. I didn't define it because it comes from the provider. Okay, so what's a layer? How do I create it? In each, okay, in each service, okay, keep in mind, this is a service. A ser I call a service an API. It's easier for me to understand that. Okay, so a service is an API. In each service, I always keep, um, uh, a directory which is named layer and usually I only have one layer per service. It might sound funny because you might say but but maybe you need to to separate your layers like let's say let's create a layer with uh, HTTP packages and let's create a layer for AI packages and let's you know you can create a layer per need. I don't like that. I like creating a layer per service. 
okay? Because my services are so thin and small and they're so like uh, microservices that if I break them down to very, very small pieces, even if they use the same layer, they are still light, okay? So best practice that I use is use the same layer and only a single layer to uh, a service. So probably the Grit API also have its own layer, okay? This also has its own layer. Great, so I use a layer per service and usually I don't use more than one, okay? You can attach five layers, I use only one, okay? I'm not gonna go through how I created this layer, you are welcome to see how it goes. And I think it's very important for you to learn from this repository because I find that the AWS docs regarding the, the structure of the layer is a bit complicated, you know? So in case you wanna really, you wanna really understand how it's built, you know, how, what the structure of layer and how it should be. So this is how it is for Python, you know, you should do it like that. And for Node.js should, should be like that. And once you really deploy those layers and build those layers, you'll see which artifacts do you get, okay? I will just go through, you know, I don't like doing things in the air, like just talking. Let's just see a glance, okay? You see that I'm in the to-do API layer serverless YAML, so even the layer was deployed with serverless framework, okay? I named it serverless template to-do API layer, Let's see it in the stacks, okay? Going to the CloudFormation stacks. Where is it? Serverless template to do API layer dev, okay? Just to prove, hold on, just to prove that it's this one, pack it individually, and then I just, uh, I'm not gonna dive into it, but I just referenced to the to do API layer. I created a script that wraps my dependencies properly it's a very simple bash script. You are welcome to just, you know, view it and see how it goes. And that's it. Okay, so this is regarding the layers. But I want to go back and talk about plugins. Okay, before we even go to the reading the logs, because the time is, is out. So if you want to leave, feel free. Either way, it's recorded. Um, here I'm referencing to, to a Lambda layer. Now, a Lambda layer, each time you redeploy it, it, it gets a version, okay, a newer version. And the same goes for a Lambda function, right? So we use here the word latest, okay? That's a, a, let's say a reserved keyword that is used by the plugin, hold on, let's go up, 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 by the plugin serverless latest, latest layer version. So if I install this plugin, this also means you need to install it, okay? So if you wonder how I got this plugin, you can just search for it, serverless layer, uh, latest layer version, I'm using NPM, you know, but you can, you know, you also need to use NPM, but like, remember, it's not related to your runtime. So even though serverless framework is running on NPM and, no, and Node, you can still do stuff in Python, okay? This is just the, the wrapping, okay? Server's layer latest version, then you got the explanations of how to use it, how to install it. You know, you install it to your dev dependencies, and then you just reference it in your serverless YAML file, just like I did. And then when you reference to Lambda layers, like I did in here, when you put here the latest, you don't need to update uh, this number. And I want to show you this number, okay? Because I don't think it's really understood. Like each time you deploy a layer, okay, I mean the... Let's go to the create function, to the API create function. If I go to the layer that is attached to this function, you can see here 74. So this means I redeployed this layer 74 times because each time you redeploy a layer, you get a new version. How, like, I, I don't think I did it manually. This happens automatically because of my CI CD. You know, I use drone, okay, drone IO. I use it to, to deploy the whole application automatically. So each time it deploys the application, it deploys a new Lambda layer version, and I don't need to maintain it in my code, okay, in my serverless YAML. So it's also amazing, a plugin which saves me updating manually stuff, amazing. Another thing I wanna say about layers, here I'm just referencing to an existing layer, okay? Same goes in the function itself. Here I'm not creating a layer, I'm just referencing to an existing layer, okay? If you wonder how do you create a layer with serverless framework, because this can also be done in the same serverless YAML file, you do it, if I'm jumping back to the to-do API layer serverless YAML of this, uh, this uh, package, you know, service, 
Then you can see after provider there is also a reserved keyword which is named layers. Hold on, I'm gonna jump, I wanna show you the differences. This layers is indented under provider. So this means I'm just referencing to an existing layer. This layers actually creates the layer in AWS. Okay, this is what creates this layer in AWS, which includes all the packages and dependencies that I need, blah, blah. Okay, so it's very important to understand the differences. Here I'm creating, here I'm just referencing. In case you wonder what, you know, let's read all of these because you need to, to provide a full ARN, a full Amazon resource name. So let's read it, okay? I'll just take the layer, you know, I'll copy the ARN over here, over here, and just, you know, let's, let's, sorry, over here, and let's just follow through, okay? This and this, let's read it together. ARN, AWS, AWS, Lambda, Lambda. Suddenly here you see region. This is EU West 1. Remember, we reference to the provider and then region. Great. Now you see a hash, a hash sign. But Mayor, you told us that the serverless framework, when you want to use a, a, a keyword or reserve something for the serverless framework, you need to use the dollar. Where did this come from? Well, I'm also using another plugin, which is named sudo parameters. So if we scroll up over here, this allows me to use uh, a cloud formation pseudo parameters. So before I get, you know, before you, you get lost in what I'm just saying, cloud formation provides built in pseudo parameters. This means cloud formation has, I just wanna show you real, real quick. Okay, just real, real quick. AWS cloud formation pseudo parameters. You know, Google will fix me if I'm wrong. So if you wanna know which pseudo parameters are available, you get the account ID that is being deployed. I have no idea what's notifications ARN. You get the no value, which is useful. It's like a null value. You get the partition, uh, which is, you know, for usually used with the gov region, the stack ID, the stack name, URL suffix. You get a lot of information of the current stack and, and the current account, okay? So these are the, sudo, the available pseudo parameters. By the way, this is for AWS, okay? So if you're using, again, other cloud providers, so look at the documentation for the other cloud provider. Probably this is relevant only to AWS, okay? So going back to my Lambda layer, okay, I was here. So I'm referencing the AWS account. This is my AWS account number. Layer is a built-in word, layer, layer. And then you see here, to do, dev, okay, to do, and then the stage, you see here, to do dev. And then you see the number 74, and here it's interpret, interpreted as latest. One more thing to say about this um, interpreted as latest. The deployment, okay, after you deploy the layer, remember I told you uh, the, the number here goes up, it will be 75. This means that if you want your application to get the latest layer, you must also redeploy the service. I'm repeating that just to be clear, okay? The fact that I redeployed the layer and it got updated doesn't mean all of my APIs will also get updated. You know, my Lambda functions will not automatically reference to the latest layer, okay? This just means that if you uh, uh, deploy, redeploy the layer, you need to redeploy your APIs to reference them to the latest layer, but you won't need, okay, you won't need to write down the version of the layer because it will get interpret, interpreted automatically upon deployment, upon doing the serverless deploy dash dash stage equals dev, okay? So that's very important to understand. Updating a layer doesn't automatically makes all your uh, uh, functions reference to the latest layer. And why is that good? Why, why is this behavior? Because if you created a corrupted layer and then and your service is running in production, and then all of your functions are referencing to this new layer, that's bad, okay? So that's just, just a simple example, but you don't want stuff to happen all the time automatically, okay? So you need to, to redeploy all your functions. All right, that's it. All we gotta do now, okay, that's the only thing that I'm gonna go through is how I actually deployed all of the stuff that you see in here, okay? Um, you know, we got here this uh, great, 
just pasting it again if you want to go. We got here this, uh, this uh, great uh, GitHub repository, but how do you actually deploy, okay? So you can just, if you want, not now, you know, if you want to do it with, uh, when you watch the recording, but you can just use the get started and clone this repository and follow the steps of how to uh, uh, build the application and the layers, deploy the AWS resources, deploy the AWS Lambda layers, and then deploy the functions. Keep in mind the order of what we're doing here, okay? First, we build the application. When I say build, I mean compile, okay? I'm compiling my TypeScript files to JS files. In Python, I just wrap it, you know, I just uh, uh, create the layer and the relevant packages, but I don't know if there is a package manager for Python like we have in, uh, in uh, TypeScript. Maybe if someone else knows, uh, feel free to share in the chat. So here we are doing the compilation of the application, deploying first the AWS resources. Now, why is it important to deploy the, these resources first? Because we are referencing to these resources in our Lambda functions, reminding you that the to-do API is referencing to the API gateway, and also the grid API is referencing to the API gateway, and to-do API is referencing also the S3 bucket. So deploy this first. We also deploy first the layers, because again, Lambda functions are referencing to the layers. And now let's see how we read the logs. You are welcome also to just do what I'm doing and click on this button over here. I will share the link. You, you can access this uh, builds like I do. This is my drone IO, you know, it's a free CI CD tool that you can use to build and deploy your application. It's very easy to use and learn. Um, and if I click here, you can see that I deployed it three hours ago. I just you know, updated the readme file and it redeployed everything. It cr created everything that you see over here. Okay, instead of doing it manually, you know, doing all of the steps that I've just said manually, deploy this, build this, it does it over here. So we're going to read this together. And of course I'll zoom in. And if you want, here's a direct link to it. So first of all, just like you're supposed to do, it clones the repository right? Close the repository at master. Okay, that's the first step in drone. Now let's talk about the build step. So after we did this uh, clone, I go to, okay, I run the, I wrote some bash scripts uh, for the build, okay? So in the, mm -mm, you'll see here in the scripts app build, this is the bash script which builds my application. Basically what it does, it goes to the services folder goes to each folder which ends with API and then runs the yarn build command okay since I'm writing everything in uh, with package JSON and TypeScript I don't want to I don't want to lose those uh, Python guys so I'll just uh, or girls of course so I'll just leave it but this is what the script does okay it builds the application and you can see it over here I'm running it with bash bash script run this and then I put some cool emojis, identifying services folders, it looks in services, searches for folders with API, and it just goes through, you know, it goes through um, building grid API, for example. So it runs the yarn install, which means install all the relevant packages, and then build the API, and it builds the layer. So eventually it's a compilation, okay? I don't think we need to go through that, but it iterates over all your folders, and builds the layers if there are any and builds the functions if there are any okay this is what it does that's the build let's talk about the deploy because this is why we're here we are here so first i told you deploy the aws resources by the way you can also deploy the aws resources and the lambda layers simultaneously because they are not related to each other right they are not correlated okay uh Questions so far, anything that you have to ask, maybe something is not clear before I move on because after this we are done. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about maybe some cool resources that you can learn from, but after this we are done. So any questions so far? So since I see we still have viewers and I'm shocked, uh, do you wanna send a message just to see that you are here and la la la?
I like this delay. I told you I like this quiet because it's good. You have some time to relax for my voice. Okay, you are alive. Okay, I just wanted to see one message to make sure the stream is working. Everything is fine. Great. Okay, so deploying the AWS resources. Okay, reminding you AWS resources, the API gateway and the to-do bucket, you know, S3 bucket. So it's, I'm going to the AWS uh, resources. Hold on one second. I will just put it over here. Going to the AWS CD, AWS resources folder, which is this folder. Okay. And then I run the command yarn deploy dev. In case you wonder why, why you see every time the yarn deploy dev, behind this command, which is in the package JSON uh, in this folder, you will see in the scripts yarn deploy devs mean yarn deploy dev. Where is it? Yarn deploy dev means SLS deploy stage dev. And you can also see it over here. Okay. Because you'll see it a lot. This is why I'm bothering to tell you about it. Okay. So SLS deploy dev staging. Finally, you. Finally, you see, you know, the deployment. So first of all, it packages everything and then uploads CloudFormation templates to S3. Hold on just one second, okay? I told you that I'm going to talk about the serverless deployment bucket name that we see in every stack. See serverless deployment bucket name, like each stack, even though I didn't do it, has this server and deployment bucket, serverless bucket policy, you know? This is automatically created by the serverless framework, right? And the whole idea here is that, as I told you, serverless framework generates a CloudFormation template and then it uploads this CloudFormation template to S3, you know, a specific S3 bucket. So first it creates it, you know, so for the first time that you deploy a stack, it might take even, you know, a few seconds more because it needs to create a bucket and then upload the uh, CloudFormation uh, template for the first time. But after that, the deployments will be only for your resources, okay? So this is what you see over here, uploading CloudFormation uh, file to S3 and validating, uh, uploading artifacts, validating template, and then finally updating the stack. Reminding you, we don't have here any, any functions, any layers, any API gateways, which is the endpoint. We only have here resources, okay? In this case, we have four resources. You can see them over here, one, two, three, four. I didn't create those two. They were created automatically. We only did this and this. Okay. Moving on to the Lambda layers. Uh, say, same as I told you over here, first of all, uh, uploading CloudFormation to S3, uploading artifacts. Now, what are the artifacts? This is the, the packages, you know? So if I, the Lambda layer contains the packages that I installed. So I'm uploading, to, uploading this file to S3 and this happens automatically, of course, and then it updates the stack. Okay, same, this is for the to-do API and then it happens also for the grid API, okay? Uploading CloudFormation to S3 and then you see here, this is much bigger. One more word about Lambda layers. You might wonder like, okay, but why are you using it? You know, so for example, in Israel, the internet connection is not so fast, okay? And besides that, if you can save, you know, uh, space to save costs of storage of transferring data, then think how amazing it is that I can create one layer of 3.82 megabytes. And, but my function, which is probably the thing that I'm deploying much more, okay, is, okay, I just want to show you the size of the function is, you know, it's in bytes, you know, it's even less than one kilobyte, right? So I deployed the layer once, and then my function, which is probably is going to change a lot because I'm changing the code and blah, blah, is, is very, very light. So this is very good to use layers if you deploy, if you, you know, develop a lot and deploy a lot. It's, it's much nicer to deploy small files. It, and then the only waiting time that you have is for this CloudFormation um, stack to be created. Okay. So going to the, uh, you understood, I think you already understood that, but just showing you again the Lambda layers, what we have here as the output, you see here, let's go back to the to-do API layer, for example. So we got here, we didn't create anything but layers in this step. So in this step, you see the layer ARN. The reason you see here asterisk is because I'm using, I, 
in drone, I was able to add a secret, you know, a secret of region, and then uh, this is why you see it as a secret, okay? There isn't two secrets in drone, because think about it, this application is connecting to my AWS account and actually does stuff, you know, it actually deploys resources. So I need to give it some access, you know. So I used, I, I created some secrets in drone. Some of them were the, one of them was the region. This is why every time you see the region, it will be hidden. But you know, it's EU West 1, you know, it's not really a secret. But my AWS keys are secret and you can't really see them over here. Okay. And you see here the, the output. Great. Now, if you wonder why you have this step, this just, make sure that this and this happened before I'm deploying the uh, to do and greet API functions. So let's see the function itself. Again, creating a bucket, uploading, L look, look how much it weighs, you know, amazing, right? It's, it's like what, seven kilobytes, eight kilobytes per function because it only has two files and they are uh, generated with Webpack. So it's even smaller, so it's amazing. But after you deploy the functions, you know, after you deploy, sorry, this service, okay, I think even the name here is not so good because eventually to do API is a service, okay? These are layers, yeah, but this is a service. And this service contains multiple functions, right? So here, when you deploy functions with an API gateway, you can see here, you know, with, sorry, with an HTTP event, you can see here which available paths you can use. Right, so you got the functions names over here and here how you can access those functions, you know, and, and this is real, okay, we can test it even now and I will test it in a second, I will show you that it really works. And the same goes for the grid API, we only have one path over here because I created only one function, you know, I just wanted to show you it works in Python. And this step only makes sure that this and this happened so I can do the usage. When I refer to the usage, I mean look in the serverless template, usage that just imitates, you know, this is like the testing step. This is just like uh, get the API uh, gateway endpoint, you know, that just to make sure you understand, this is my API gateway endpoint, reminding you that this is my region. Okay, so in case you wonder why it's asterisk, it's the region. I declared it over here as a variable, and then I just start curling it, you know, I just start hitting my functions, right? So this is the usage, you know, I, I saved it, you know, API gateway, and then I saved it over here, and I tested it, blah, blah, and just to finish it, to, to, to finish with a nice example, I will go to the to do API functions. As part of, uh, of the usage over here, I did create an object in my S3 bucket. So let's just list the objects, okay? So let's just use this. You can also use it on your own machine, you know, just replace this with EU West one. And I'm going to list all the objects that I have. So apparently I created two, maybe somebody tried to do it on their own. And I hope I won't see any curses or something like that when I see what's in the bucket and I will only see something nice. So S3, I wanna show you, you know, how it looks like in the bucket itself. So to do's, to do, where is my bucket? This is my bucket, to do bucket. I should see two objects. Okay, I just want to show you, see here, list, list, okay, this lists the objects in my bucket, but I want, also want to get the, uh, the value of the user defined metadata that I talked about. So let's say get slash, I think that's the path, let's see. So here I have get slash and then the ID, you know, that I got from here. So let's see this, for example, when this was created, Sorry, driving you crazy. When this was created, I'm, I'll create a new tab. When this was created, somebody put some content over here. And what was the content? Some content. Okay, this is for my test. And the other one, for example, and again, I hope I won't see any curses or something like that. And the other one is this, which is the same, some content. So I guess somebody just copy pasted my code. Okay, so this bucket contains two objects. They, help, they both have the same... Uh, Content, but can we see it over here, please? Yes, we can. Let's click on one of them. Uh, if you try to access one of the objects, you know, directly like this, you can see that it's access denied, reminding you this bucket is, um, is private. If I go to properties, I go to metadata, you will see here we have this content, you know. This is related to how I developed it, you know, you don't really have to do that. 
content and then in here you can see the content of uh, the object you know the to do okay what I need to do okay uh, another quick thing uh, regarding um, s3 buckets the name of the s3 bucket as you can see in here hold on I will just show you as you can see in here the name of this bucket was generated automatically by serverless framework how did this happen I'm not gonna dive into too much details but remember we called the bucket you know the physical ID of the bucket is to do bucket with capital T and capital B so serverless framework automatically put the service name including the stage and it took the resource ID you know the physical ID lower cased it and then added some gener pre-generated uh, you know generated some string why did it do that because s3 buckets must be named across all aws uniquely so your bucket name must be unique so in case you want to deploy this application and you don't want anyone else you know also uh, uh get you know get into conflict with somebody else's uh, bucket serverless framework added this automatically so that's also amazing just to to be clear in the cloud formation stacks remember we talked about export name i think it's something i forgot to to mention in cloud formation stacks i talked about the outputs for example about this this needs okay this needs to be unique per region per account so in your account in the same region you can only have one name like this name must be unique okay s3 buckets must be unique across all aws across all accounts you know not even if it's not your account okay so this is why this generated this and just to finish with a good taste i want to show you the references you know so you get to know mm -mm. if you go down you can see you know the goal of this of what we just did you can see you know you can just expand everything over here i just try to make it to make it light you, if you want to modify the code and change stuff, you can just expand this and see what, what needs to be done. Uh, to clean up, to destroy all the resources, just run the following commands. I already told you the theory, you know, includes all of the theory stuff. And also check, the only resource I want to talk about is this one. This is like the best website ever to learn about serverless framework and any serverless uh, stack. This is called serverlessstack.com. It's free. I, I wouldn't publish, you know, something that is not uh, free. And you can also download it as PDF in case you're offline or something. And uh, it's, it has amazing stuff, like best practices for building serverless framework. And I just want to show you just very, very quick. First of all, here it is in the chat. And for example, uh, I don't know, uh, let, let's take something about the project structure. Okay, st structure. Okay, structure environments across AWS account. And... It really explains, you know, and dives into to the very little details of everything, you know, consolidated billing and everything, and what is IAM and ARN and everything that is related to serverless um, services in AWS is explained over here, and it's amazing. So I really recommend, uh, if you want to learn more about serverless, just go to this website. You can learn a lot of stuff over here, you know, what is Lambda, what is... And that's it, you know, instead of uh, one hour and uh, 30 minutes, it's like two hours, but it's a recording, so who cares? Um, any questions before I close this uh, meetup? Waiting for your questions. If you want to ask questions, by the way, after this meetup, you're welcome to join our uh, Facebook group, you know, facebook.com slash group slash opsayel. Just ask a question. If you want, you can tag me over there, Meir Gabay. I will write my name again over here, just in case you didn't understand. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed this webinar. And uh, bye.